We are in Habakkuk uh, chapter 2. We want to look at just three verses tonight. I don't know if this is enough for a sermon or not, but we'll try it, okay? Yeah, that's probably kind of funny because, yeah, we, we, we will have enough here for a sermon. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the theme here. Whoops. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? I mean, are you, are you messing with me tonight? No, I'm just teasing. I know, I know you're not. I'm just teasing. All right. Uh, theme, the just shall live by faith. And we are into the second chapter here. We have Habakkuk's first question, uh, God's first answer, Habakkuk's second question, and then God's second answer. So that's uh, where we are in terms of the flow of the book. Habakkuk wrote sometime prior to the first Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in 605 B.C. We don't really know when, maybe even 20 years before that, like 625 to 605, somewhere in that area, but somewhere just before the, uh, the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in 605. And what was going on in Judah was, was not good. It was great wickedness going on in the land. It was a time characterized by great violence as we see in the opening verses in Habakkuk. And so Habakkuk, as he's looking at this situation, he's been praying about this, and God's not doing anything about it. He's sitting there, God, why? He couldn't understand why God is not doing anything about the terrible situation in terms of the sinfulness going on amongst his own people. But when God told him that he was doing something about it, uh, in fact, he was raising up the Chaldeans, otherwise known as the Babylonians, to bring about judgment on his people, that bothered Habakkuk even more than his original concern. And so chapter uh, 1 is defined by two why questions. Chapter 1, verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? He's talking about in the context of Judah. For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and, con and contention arises. So he has concerns, again, about the sin that's going on amongst his, his own people in Judah there. But then God says, I'm raising up, okay, here's the, here's the answer. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Well, then he has another why question in, in verse 13. You are a pure eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked, that is Babylon, devours a person more righteous than he, that is Judah. So he can't understand how this could be true of God, his understanding of God's holiness, and how God could work this way. However, in sharing his complaint, we note that Habakkuk starts from a position of faith, although he can't understand the whys uh, that he expresses in his consternation, he does so reverently. Uh, and uh, we know th this, uh, he really starts from a position of faith in Habakkuk 1.12. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you have marked them for correction. There's a lots of positive things here that he states about God. And uh, again, he's really coming from a position of faith. Note uh, his emphasis. Uh, God's from everlasting. That's, that's, he's eternal. He's the Lord. This is the, the covenant name Yahweh, uh, emphasizing God's faithful covenant-keeping nature. And he's holy, meaning he's unique. He's set apart. He's the rock. He's stable. You can count on him. And therefore, he says, we shall not die. He's recognizing that God's going to preserve them. He believes that. After all, he believes in the Lord as Yahweh, uh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, and appointed them for judgment. He's talking about his own people, that God has ordained their punishment, and then he, they are marked out for correction, not extinction. So he states a lot of positive things about God here in his opening statement. So as a man of faith, after laying out his complaint of consternation, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand and set myself to see what, what he, that is what God, will say to me. And the language here is really that of a, of a watchman. As he says, I, I will stand my watch. I will set myself on the rampart. And so it indicates that he saw himself not merely asking for himself, but really asking as a, as a messenger of God's people. Well, God answers this kind of honest and reverent inquiry. Uh, and God's answer is now seen in chapter 2, 
uh, verse 2 through 20. And so we're going to look at the first three verses tonight in uh, chapter uh, 2, uh, verse 2 through 4, of which uh, 2 4 is the key verse of the entire book. In fact, it's one of the most important verses in the Bible. That's why we're going to spend some, uh, some time on it tonight. Uh, let's begin. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. The, then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. The Lord, that is Yahweh, told Habakkuk uh, to write out the answer given to him in vision form. So it was given in vision form. So he says, okay, you saw the vision, you got the message in vision form, I want you to write it out. He wants him to write it out clearly on tablets, uh, probably uh, clay tablets. And God wanted this message clearly preserved. Given in vision form, he wanted it clearly written out to make it plain and simple. And then God wanted it broadcast far and wide uh, that he may run who reads it. The idea here is that once the person reads the message, uh, they would clearly understand it, and then they would run to spread the news throughout the land. That's the idea. I want you to fast forward with me for just a moment. We're not going there tonight, but fast forward with me in your mind for just a moment here. The message was, as we jump forward, uh, is that uh, God is going to indeed judge Babylon. Now, we've already seen he's raising up the Chaldeans to bring disciplinary judgment on his own people. But the rest of the message is, yes, God is indeed going to judge Babylon. And uh, so that's uh, the rest of the message that he's going to now share in the, the remainder of the chapter here. But note carefully the instruction from God. Did you see it here in, in verse 2? He says, uh, write the vision and make it plain. Make it plain. Now, that's, this is very interesting. Um, the word plain, beer, in the Hebrew uh, means, uh, note the expositors here, to make plain may refer to clarity either in form, that is uh, by engraving the words, or in content, in content. And I tend to think, of course, you know, it's, if it's not legible, you're not going to be able to read it. That makes no sense. But I think the point is he wants it spelled out to, to where it's understandably very clear, where it's understandably very plain. So I think uh, I tend to, to think the emphasis here is on the content. And the point is God wanted the message to be clear so the people would plainly understand it. Bible knowledge commentary, God does not mumble. He speaks with clarity and forthrightness. Now I want to I use this as just a little jumping off point because this, whether you realize it or not, is a mega, mega issue in uh, Christianity today. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the doctrine of clarity or that which is known as uh, perspicuity, perspicuity. Uh, it has become a really big deal, and I'll explain what I mean by this. Uh, Dr. Randy Goluza, Goluza, Goluza is president of the Institute for Creation Research, and he has recently written an article uh, on this issue titled, ICR Upholds the Clarity of Scripture. And I want to read just a few excerpts here to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, this is from Randy uh, Galuzzo. Clarity affirms that anybody can understand the plain message of Bible passages. It means that God clearly communicates what he wants to say to people at any time and in any culture when they read an accurate translation of the Bible. The average person who doesn't have an advanced degree in science or theology can attain a clear understanding of what the Bible means. In short, with nothing more than our own reading of the Bible's words, Christ clearly communicates his thoughts to us regardless of whether we are a religious cleric or a hotel clerk. Randy then recounts a debate he had with a theistic evolutionist and a progressive creationist. What's the difference between those two, by the way? The answer is not much. There are some technical differences here as far as how they, how they deal with things, but not, not much. So uh, these people are all claiming to believe in God, too. But a theistic evolution says, well, we believe in evolution. We just think God's behind the evolution. And uh, the progressive creationist believes, well, well, God did it in, in stages, you know, as we, as we go along. And so they all agree that God's behind it. He continues, everyone on the panel claimed to endorse biblical inspiration and inerrancy. They all claim we believe the Bible's inspired. We believe it was without error. 
It was given by God. But he says, but the debate centered on whether Christians could reliably arrive at a correct biblical interpretation by giving words their normal meaning in their normal context, or if outside information supplied by scientists was also essential. You see where this is going? Thus, the crux was not strictly over science, but over the sharp division about biblical clarity. Randy points out that some people are now saying what is needed between the Bible and the reader is what he calls an interpretive filter. An interpretive filter. And he quotes one such person as saying, quote, everyone should read the Bible. We agree with that so far, right? Yeah. Everyone should read the Bible, and I'd argue should read it with a sharply critical eye and the guidance of reputable critics and historians. Though this may be too much to ask for those steeped in literal belief, that is, those holding to biblical clarity. You see the filter there, the interpretive filter? You see what it is? It's you need guidance from reputable critics and historians and scientists. You see, you just can't get this by yourself. You need a filter. It needs to come to you in filtered form, not just raw. And so he says, thus, if Christians allow scientists to tell them how to understand the Bible rather than relying on the Bible's words for themselves and the Holy Spirit, then scientists now sit as the Christian's immediate authority instead of the Bible. So to keep the Bible in its proper place or of direct authority, don't interpret the Bible through the lens of the world's science or philosophy. By reclaiming, and I think that's an important word, by reclaiming biblical clarity, Christians embrace a truth that releases them from the bondage of theological or scientific elites who proudly insert themselves as an essential interpretive filter between believers and the Bible. This is a really huge deal. The reason it's huge is because as he started out, these people say, well, we believe in inerrancy too. We believe in inspiration too, but they don't really believe in the clarity of Scripture and that in really the priesthood of all believers, that the Bible is its own power for, for regular people. You see, the doctrine of clarity is, after all, a really big deal. Uh, if you can't take the Bible for what it plainly says, then you, know, you don't really personally have any idea what the message of God really is. You need your scientist, you need your expert, you need your you know, person with three degrees. And then you can do amazing things. You can turn the six-day creation account into billions of years and so forth. It's amazing what, you have, what happens when you put it through the filter. Well, God told Habakkuk, make it plain. I like that. I like that little line right there. Make it plain that he may run who reads it. I submit to you, God ordained the message to be plain. Not that there aren't difficult things along the way, but in terms of the basic message of the Bible, you can get this. The message of God is really not complicated. As was said, God did not mumble. Anyone who is sincere and has an accurate translation of the Bible with God's help can get it. This is not just for the elites or for the scholars. You know, that's what the Reformation did for us, by the way. You put the Bible back into the hands of regular folks, the priesthood of all believers. It's not just for scholars. The Reformation became a major movement because the Bible was made available in the common language of the people so they could read it for themselves. God made it plain. Verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The first thing God says about this vision is that it is for an appointed time. You see, life is according to God's appointments. Uh, at the appointed time, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season, 
a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. And then we run to the conclusion of the matter, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God's in charge of the calendar. And he has set times for what he has ordained to happen. It is for an appointed time, he says here in verse 3. Now, this phrase, when it says here, but at the end it will speak and will not lie, involves metaphorical language. The word speak means to breathe or to pant, and the sense is that this prophetic truth pants towards the end. Uh, it will run its course, finishing just as God determines. So thus the truth here is pictured as, as uh, a living, breathing message from God that is actively moving towards completion, just like a marathon runner, a steady marathon runner, is moving towards completion of his race. Now, related to this is the truth that Scripture is inspired, which literally means God breathed. The living God breathed the word, and it always has a fulfillment according to its appointed time. Notice he says, it will not lie. Whatever God says, if it's the message of God, it will not lie. It, that means it is the truth. It will see fulfillment exactly as God has said. Prophetic truth is always 100% accurate. It's always 100% uh, fulfilled, 100% of the time. It never lies. But here's the thing. Uh, God's timetable often involves waiting, waiting. Uh, the key is that it happens according to God's timetable. God says here, though it tarries, wait for it. You know, you're going you're to have to sit tight here a little bit. What I'm sharing with you is going to take a little bit to, to uh, unravel. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. In other words, it will involve a process. There will be a time of waiting, but God says to wait for it, because it will surely come to pass. It's just a matter of timing. And when the time comes for it to be fulfilled, God says it will not tarry. So note the balance. Though it tarries, on the one hand, on the other, it will not tarry. Both are true. There's a time for tarrying, waiting, and then there's the appointed time. It will happen with no more waiting in accordance with God's perfect timing. A little footnote here. Uh, God often draws the prophetic picture with a broad brush. And we see that here in Habakkuk chapter 2 in this vision. You see, all Habakkuk could see was Judah. God showed him that he was doing something on a much bigger stage, uh, the world stage. Habakkuk thought in terms of, God, of Judah's judgment. God showed him the bigger picture of Babylon's coming judgment. We consistently think way too small. God's got bigger plans than we ever imagined. Uh, you think about this. I think about this sometimes. You know, he's at work in my life. He's at work in your life and all these different people's lives. Boy, just, boy, this is a pretty big job, working in all these different people's lives. And they all got kind of, they all got issues. You have family? You have issues. You say, how do you know that? I, 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 I've been around the block several times. Everybody has issues. They do. It just happens. We think through our little prism related to our little context, but God's got the big, comprehensive, all, uh, overall picture in view. We think in terms of the short run, God plans in terms of the long run. In fact, as we study through chapter 2, we will see that what is being revealed takes us all the way to the kingdom that is to come. That's the big picture view that is being presented here. We're still waiting for some of this to find fulfillment. Obviously, we're not in the kingdom yet. We're on a way, but we're not there. Well, mankind never sees the entire pattern of God's big picture plan, and therefore sometimes long-awaited events that seem to be delayed can be disappointing. We need to be told, you know, wait for it. Wait for it. It's coming. As Peter said, we must not forget that with the Lord, uh, 1,000 years is as one day, and so forth. Uh, note, uh, as we look at uh, the big picture here, what's being presented, 
We know that there were three sieges of Jerusalem by Babylon, which is, he said, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. They're, they're going to bring judgment. And they did. 605, 597, uh, 586. But then he said, yeah, I'm going to bring down Babylon. That's what chapter 2, the remainder, was about. That happened in 539 B.C. So it did happen. Took a little bit of time, as he said it would, but it happened exactly as he had predicted. Dr. Mark Hitchcock has written a book uh, called The Amazing Claims of Bible Prophecy. I really like Mark Hitchcock. And uh, he writes this. Uh, the Bible is a book of prophecy. It contains about 1,000 prophecies, about 500 of which have already been fulfilled down to the minutest detail. With this kind of a proven track record, 500 prophecies fulfilled with 100% accuracy, we can believe with confidence that the remaining 500 yet to be fulfilled prophecies will also come to pass at their appointed times. Indeed, that is it. We have near partial fulfillment. We have distant complete. And uh, because of what's been fulfilled, we can believe God for what is yet to be fulfilled. Well, note that God said there would be a lapse in time, but it would be fulfilled. Any lapse in time should not be construed as either a failure or a deception. It just awaits the appointed time for fulfillment. And uh, note this, uh, the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, applied this text of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, to the second coming of Christ. Uh, and you'll notice a little, a little distinction here. Habakkuk 2, 3, uh, the vision is yet for an appointed time. At the end it will speak and will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it. Uh, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. But in, uh, he's quoting this in Hebrews, uh, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. It's interesting. He's talking about it, uh, this, this, uh, this event that's going to happen in relationship to Babylon in chapter 2. But now under inspiration, uh, the writer of Hebrews applies it to Jesus Christ. Wycliffe Bible Commentary says, the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, using the LXX, that is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, has adapted the text to the promise of the second coming of Christ. An event, uh, an event equal certain, equally certain in God's plan, though it may seem in the eyes of man to be unduly delayed. So kind of making some application there. They were waiting for God to do something about Babylon, we're waiting for the second coming. Liberty Bible Commentary says, Habakkuk waited for the fulfillment of the word of the Lord pertaining to the destruction of Chaldea. But we wait for the fulfillment of the word of the Lord pertaining to his return. From our perspective, we can see that the Lord completely fulfilled his word to Habakkuk. And we can have assurance that he will fulfill his word to us just as completely. Good application. All right, well, we come to verse 4. And we read there, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Well, here we have the key verse of the book. And frankly, it's one of the most important statements in Scripture. Tim LaHaye says this statement in verse 4 is the central theme of all Scripture. It certainly is a main premise. The just shall live by faith. Now, we have presented here a contrast between the proud in soul who are not right with God and the just who live by faith. You see, pride is the besetting sin of mankind. Uh, it is the fundamental sin problem. Most all other sin issues are in one way or another related to the rebellion of pride. And here it is applied to Babylon. The proud in this context uh, represent the Babylonian nation, uh, of which, uh, which was headed up by Nebuchadnezzar, who it really exemplified the sin of pride. The word translated here as proud has the basic meaning of puffed up or swollen. Uh, the Babylonian people were like a bloated toad, all full of themselves, hopping along towards judgment. They just didn't know it. We have noted in chapter 1 how in figurative terms the proud Babylonians are, are seen to worship their own military power, uh, lots of pride, pride here. We saw it in chapter 1, and now he's referencing it in chapter 2. But chapter 1, verse 11, Then they sweep by like the wind and go on guilty men whose might is their God. 
He's speaking about the Babylonians. See their pride there? They really, we are something. Look at us. Nobody can stop us. Verse 16, therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes his offerings to his dragnet, figuratively uh, his own military power. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. So note the Babylonians were full of themselves. In effect, they worship self and the power of self. Very, very proud people. God says his soul is not upright in him. This pride is a soul problem. The word upright, by the way, denotes what is straight. His soul is not aligned straight with God. He's not straight with God. He's not right with God. It requires the humbling of repentance to properly align the soul with God. And this is the stuff of saving faith. In contrast to the proud are the just, or some translations have the righteous, who live by faith. And this is the ultimate issue. There are the proud... Those are the lost and the saved. In contrast, the saved, who are the humble people of faith. And faith, by its very nature, has been humbled. Uh, when you come to faith in Christ, it's a humbling experience. You don't have anything to bring. You don't have anything. You're not holding the self anymore. You say, okay, I, I, I see. It's not about me anymore. It's all about you. It's all about Jesus. This verse speaks to the very nature of true faith. That's why I think it's so important. And this is the great issue before God. Ultimately, on Judgment Day, every person listening to this message is either going to be in the category of faith or the category of unbelief. And every person in the world is going to be in one of those two categories. Whether we understand what is happening or not, before God, the great issue in life is the faith issue and whether we're going to respond to it with faith. That's the great issue in life. It's all, and it relates to everything that's going on in our lives all the time. Are we handling this uh, from a position of faith or not? This is what uh, God really brings out. He, he maybe wanted an intellectually satisfying answer. God says, really, I want you to know, Habakkuk, it's ultimately all about faith. The proud <clears throat> are self-sufficient. They don't think they need God. You just remember the Babylonians are very proud. We're doing this ourselves. We're in charge of our destiny. People of faith rely upon God. Even when they can't understand the whys of life, they know the character of God, and that's what they rest upon. That's faith. Spurgeon well said, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. When you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. And you know, that's what faith does. That's the issue that is being brought to bear here in Habakkuk. So we have a wicked political leader, and then an even more wicked one gets elected. We might be tempted to ask, why? But faith falls back on God and his sovereignty, even when we can't make sense of it. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. The important thing is we come back and realize God is sovereign. God hasn't changed. His character hasn't changed. And that's where my faith is. The important thing before God is not our circumstances, necessarily, or, or understanding our circumstances, but rather our faith in God. Those proud leaders are all coming down at the appointed time. That's the rest of the story here. They're all coming down at the appointed time. We just need to trust God with the big picture. We need to trust his timing. We need to trust his character. Well, what does it mean when it says, the just shall live by his faith? In this saying, uh, or, or let me put it this way, is this saying, question, is this saying that we have life by faith or that we have true faith? If we have true faith, we will live accordingly. Is it saying that we have life by faith or that if we have true faith, we will live accordingly? And in short, I'm going to argue the answer is yes. This is, however, a very theologically significant question. If you uh, know about the theological landscape and the theological battles even of recent years, and not even just recent years, through the years, uh, easy believism says it means here that you have life by faith, 
but not necessarily that you will live it out. For example, Zane Hodges wrote, quote, there is nothing to support the view that perseverance in the faith is, is an inevitable outcome of true salvation. And Zane went so far as to say that a believer can become an unbelieving believer. Well, I strongly reject that false teaching. The verse here in Habakkuk 2.4b is the key verse in the New Testament that develops a theme of justification by faith. And I have said for years, the real battles theologically that we're talking about here, everyone agrees in justification by faith. The issue is what? It's the nature of saving faith. That is the ultimate issue. This verse in Habakkuk 2.4b uh, is quoted three times in three key doctrinal books in the New Testament as seen in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. I like this quote from the Wycliffe Bible Commentary. It may be best to enrich our idea of the New Testament meaning of faith from the Old Testament. Indeed, if many modern evangelical preachers would give to the word faith the meaning which the Hebrew word bears, there would be less superficiality in the profession and practice of Christianity. Hey, there's a novel idea. Maybe we ought to trace this back to the roots of where we got the concept to start with. Namely, in this case, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4b. This makes perfect sense, since Paul and the writer of Hebrews quote from this foundational text here in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, to establish their premise of justification by faith. It makes sense that the principle regarding the, the nature of justifying faith is being built upon as we come to the New Testament. You see, further revelation builds on already existing revelation. The word translated as faith in Habakkuk 2.4b could just as well be translated as faithfulness. Let me give you a few quotes here. Uh, David uh, Levy, you know, one of uh, the guys with uh, Friends of Israel, uh, says the word translated faith in this passage is immuna, which means firmness, faithfulness, fidelity. The word translated faith denotes faithfulness. Justifying faith will manifest itself in faithful living before the Lord. I think that is the nuance. A Bible knowledge commentary. Faithfulness and faith are related. One who trusts in the Lord is one who relies on him and is faithful to him. Moody Bible commentary. Thus, these ideas are more similar than they are different. One who has faith in God will also live in faithfulness to him. Certainly not perfectly. All these things you need, need qualified, but... Uh, he's talking about the direction of life here. Likely the author intended both ideas in this verse, and I think he did. And I'll show you why as we move through here. Consider the uh, New Testament usage as Paul the writer, and, and the writer of Hebrews uh, quote from this very verse. How did they use it? What's the nuance that they, they had in mind? Well, let's look at it. Let's begin with Romans uh, 1.17, and uh, for context, Romans 1.16 and 17, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and of salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, here in Romans, uh, Paul emphasizes the believer's salvation is acquired by faith. That's verse 16. But at the same time, shows it is then lived out in faith. The righteousness acquired in saving faith is revealed from faith to faith as the just live by faith. Thus, Paul here combines faith with the fruit of faithfulness. Galatians chapter 3, and again, verse 10 and 11. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident the just shall live by faith. Well, here in Galatians, Paul shows that salvation is not achieved by keeping the works of the law, but rather is acquired simply on the basis of genuine faith alone. Here his emphasis is that we have a righteous standing before God on the basis of faith alone. We live, that is, we have eternal life by faith alone. And then one, the other, the third reference, 
uh, from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, 38, 39. Now the just shall live by faith. I mean, that's not the end of his thought. That's not the end of the sentence. The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is apostatizes. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. So we know what he's talking about. He's talking about apostates that have never really been saved. Uh, We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We are those who live by faith. We are not of those who draw back, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So clearly Hebrews uses the quote from Habakkuk 2.4 to show that a true saving faith perseveres. It continues on. And he shows that those justified by faith will live by faith in an ongoing lifestyle pattern. The context of the quote of Hebrews 10 here also is very significant because you see it segues into the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11, where we are given many examples of what saving faith looks like as uh, it is brought out there. In each case, the emphasis is on faith that demonstrates itself in the life. Just read through the examples in Hebrews chapter 11. Well, when you put all this combination together, it becomes clear that we have life by faith, but also that those who have life by faith then also live by faith. They go together. You can't really have one without the other. This phrase, justification by faith, became the watchword of the Protestant Reformation. And fittingly, the Reformers emphasized what? We are saved by faith alone. But they also said, but the faith that saves does not remain alone. You know what they, what they hit in that statement there? They hit the, the sense of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4b. Well, in wrapping this up tonight... If the prophet was expecting an answer that satisfied his intellectual qualms, that really was not forthcoming. Instead, God emphasized that the real important thing is faith, to trust in his character. Holman Christian Standard Bible, God does not have to explain himself to humans. Uh, We must let God be God and trust in his goodness, even when we find his ways difficult to understand. This is a lesson on faith. And we may have tough questions that we can't figure out, and indeed some things may even seem to be contradictory to us, but we must humble ourselves and realize that we see only a small part of the big picture. God alone sees everything. And if we truly saw everything, we would see that God is totally consistent, and we will see that one day, I'm convinced. We won't look at the big picture and say, oh, 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 God, there's a a little bit of a hole over here. No, 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 no. There won't be any holes. So what we are called to do is trust in the character of God, even if we can't figure it out. The nature of faith humbles itself before God and continues to faithfully trust him, even in spite of things that don't make sense. It's not up to us to figure everything out, but rather to live by faith. The faith that justifies continues on even in hard times when things don't make sense to us. I like this little saying. I've used it before. How you live is what you believe. In other words, if there's no faithfulness in your faith, then you really don't have a justifying faith. The just will live by faith. Yeah, they have life by faith, but then they live by faith as a pattern of life. Faith is the way to life, and it's a way of life. Both truths are tethered to the sense of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and both are reflected in how the New Testament quotes this reference. Well, indeed, The just shall live by faith. May we be in that category. Let's have our closing song, and then I'll close in prayer tonight.